Hi everyone, welcome to DNH 146. We are going to be discussing chapter 10 today, which is occlusal trauma. And luckily this is going to be mostly a review for you from previous classes. But um, let's do an introduction. Soon after the identification of bacteria as a risk factor, and you know that's the primary etiological risk factor is dental biofilm. Um, the role of occlusion in periodontal diseases was considered. Occlusion describes the contact relationship of the teeth in function as well as dysfunction. So occlusion is defined as any contact between the incisal or occlusal surfaces of the maxillary and mandibular teeth. So all tooth contacts during swallowing and chewing are taken into consideration. And this is the only time that teeth should be contacting during swallowing and chewing. When we are at rest, our mouth is at rest, our teeth should not be in a biting occlusion. Let's review some terms. We've got centric occlusion and centric relation. So centric occlusion is the maximum intercuspation or contact of the maxillary and mandibular teeth. So think about biting down really, really hard. Okay, that's your centric occlusion versus centric relation is the most retruded or posterior posi position of the mandible in relation to the maxilla from which lateral movements of the jaw can be made. So centric relation is really pushing the uh, mental area of your jaw back a little bit and then trying to do the excursive movements. And this is something that the dentist does when they're checking bites and occlusions in the dental office. They've got the patient's chin and they're wiggling it and trying to tell the patient to do certain things. Now, ideal occlusion occurs where the arrangement of the teeth is considered to be the most correct. So upon closing, all the maxillary and mandibular teeth come together at the same time. So there are no premature contacts. There's no crowding, no tipping, no or malpositioned teeth. Any deviation from this quote unquote ideal is termed malocclusion. So you can have malocclusion even though your occlusal, occlusal category is a class one, which is neutral occlusion. So this um, is a review of class one, two, and three class type occlusions. Remember with class two, you either have a division one or a division two. It's never just a class two by itself. Uh, I would recommend having uh, something printed out uh, chair side so you can use it as a reference if you need it uh, when you are determining occlusion in the clinic setting. But we are using Angle's classifications of malocclusion. Edward H. Angle's principles of malocclusion. And malocclusion doesn't necessarily indicate occlusal disease. It just means things aren't lined up perfectly. So functioning occlusion, what is that? Teeth that are in the function when the mandible moves in lateral, side to side, and protrusive movements, that means when the mandible comes forward, those are the excursions. Um, functioning occlusion should be checked with every patient to determine if there are occlusal prematurity. So you're asking the patient to bring their mandible forward and to bring the mandible side to side for canine to canine touching. And this is um, an example of that. And we've gone over this in other classes as far as balancing side and working side. So know what occlusion is and know what balancing and working side is. So lateral movements going side to side is defined as the direction in which the mandible is moving. So if you ask the patient to move their jaw to the left, then the left is the working side and the opposite side, which is the right side, is the non-working side. So the working side is the direction 
the jaw is moving. The working side demonstrates two types of contact. You want to line up those canines, canine to canine, and it, remember that canine protected occlusion? That means that only the maxillary and mandibular canines touch in, lap, in lateral excursion. So that's what you're looking for. Ideally, just those canines are touching. Then you're also looking for group functioning, and that is if all the posterior teeth are in contact, and you shouldn't have that. So we're talking about functional occlusion and the lateral movement still. Um, working side, non-working side. During lateral movements, there should be no contact on the balancing side, okay? Although a lot of people have them. <coughs> Excuse me the working and non-working side. So when you're canine to canine, all the posterior teeth are in contact with the group function. Then you slide the uh, mandible over, all right? So you're canine to canine. You're moving over to the right. The right is the working side and only the canines should be in contact when you're canine to canine occlusion. So protrusive occlusion is the movement of the mandible in the direction anterior to centric occlusion. Centric occlusion, remember, is just biting down really hard. That's your centric occlusion. To review centric relation is the most posterior position. And protrusive is movement of the mandible anterior to that centric occlusion. So the posterior contact is undesirable when you're bringing the mandible forward. Your teeth on the anterior should be the only ones touching and there should be no touching of the posterior. We have something called physiologic occlusion and that's occlusion that is not ideal, but is symptom free. The patient is not having any symptoms and the dentition survives or adapts to the deviation occlusion. So it pertains to most of our patients. So that's why we're always doing a follow up. Oh, they have some crepitus or clicking in the jaw or they have an S deviation upon opening or upon closing. The follow up question is, do you have any discomfort? Does the jaw give you any discomfort? And that means they're asymptomatic. And that means they have a physiological occlusion that they have adapted to. There's no pain, there's no discomfort anywhere. So you want to mark that in the patient's chart. So you've got physiologic occlusion, then pathologic occlusion. And that's when the dentition shows signs and the patient has symptoms of occlusal disease. So you have a deep overbite where the um, anterior teeth come all the way over, uh, the maxillary anterior teeth come all the way over the mandibular anterior teeth. And that could be considered a traumatic overbite. And that's something that I have. This is even after four years of ortho. Uh, I have none of my mandibular anterior showing when I bite down. In fact, my mandibular anteriors rest on my incisive papilla. So if I injure my incisive papilla anyway, i.e. pizza or something hard and crunchy, um, I can I have a hard time biting down. Now this is a picture of a deep overbite. You can see where these mandibular anterior teeth are touching and the maxillary anterior teeth are way, way covering the mandibular, right? This patient also, as you can see, is missing posterior teeth over here on the left side, patient's left, and on the patient's right. So this patient is using these maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth probably for doing a lot of their chewing. Okay, so those teeth are just being pounded, 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 more so than what they were intended for. You can see the flaring of these maxillary anterior teeth, which is indicating some sort of periodontal situation going on oftentimes. So prematurity or premature contact or occlusal interference, they all mean the same thing, occurs when there are interferences to closure of the opposing teeth. 
So it could be one tooth or a group of teeth. Individual teeth touch the opposing teeth before full closure in centric occlusion. Remember that's biting down really hard and prevent the other teeth in the arch from achieving contact. So an example of prematurities also is, for example, a placement of a restoration, be it an amalgam or a composite, and the patient feels it high. They say, I'm hitting that filling or that restoration. I'm hitting it and I can't use any of the other teeth because it's um, coming in contact prematurely. So then we have occlusal trauma. And that's defined as injury to the attachment apparatus as a result of excessive occlusal force. That's occlusal trauma. The other terms for occlusal trauma could be trauma from occlusion, periodontal traumatism, or occlusal disease. Now, honestly, I have never seen periodontal traumatism in any of um, the articles or textbooks that I've read. I have seen occlusal disease, trauma from occlusion, and occlusal trauma. But the effects of the periodontal tissues, now this is except for the gingiva, okay, could affect your temporomandibular joint, the muscles of mastication, the teeth itself, the pulp, as well as um, other occlusal interferences. Okay, now this is, these are things that can occur with occlusal trauma. So when the magnitude or size, the direction, the frequency, and the duration of these different forces exceed the reparative capacity of the attachment apparatus, and that attachment apparatus is the cementum, the periodontal ligament, and the bone, the result is occlusal trauma. So if the pounding, if the trauma exceeds what the body can repair because of the trauma, things are going to break down, just like with periodontal disease. If the bacteria takes over, okay, the body can't repair it. So we're asking the patient to make protrusive movements. Bring that lower jaw forward and bite edge to edge on the anterior teeth. And you can see how these teeth just fit like little puzzle pieces. And we're asking the patient, do you grind your teeth? No, I don't grind. I, I've never been told I grind. I don't think I grind. And then you take the patient into the excursive movements and you have signs also of attrition that you're noting. They might not be grinding now, but at some point these teeth have worn together to make this puzzle piece fit each other. At some point, it could have been when they were a teenager, who knows, it could be a current situation. So we have parafunctional habits, and those are defined as activities of the masticatory or chewing system that are beyond the normal range of function, beyond the normal range of function. So examples, chewing and swallowing are normal habits, but grinding of the teeth, clenching of the teeth, are parafunctional habits because they are outside the normal range. Think about the habits that we do um, that we don't even aren't aware of what we're doing. We're biting our fingernails, we're biting our cuticles, we're using, you know, we're biting our pens and pencils. Those type of things are beyond the normal use of teeth. Tongue thrusting and thumb sucking also creates a class two division one malocclusion. The anterior teeth, the maxillary anterior teeth start flaring because of the tongue. When we're swallowing, the tongue actually puts pressure on the lingual surfaces of the maxillary anterior for tongue thrusting or tongue, tongue I'm yeah, slurring my words, thumb sucking Right? Think about where the tongue is in relation to the thumb and where the teeth are. They accommodate. So this is an anterior bite, probably from a tongue thrust, especially when you see the tongue so anterior like that. Every time the patient swallows, they're probably placing pressure on those anterior teeth. The tongue is a very strong muscle and eventually the uh, periodontal ligaments are going to give way 
and form where the tongue is trying to make it go. So occlusal trauma doesn't cause gingivitis. Now this is what the current situation is right now as far as theory. It doesn't cause gingivitis, it doesn't cause periodontitis, doesn't cause pocket formation or gingival recession on its own. So the gingiva itself is not affected by excessive occlusal forces. Animal and human models were developed to study the relationship between periodontal inflammation and trauma from occlusion. And it's really debatable whether occlusal forces interfere with wound healing. But remember, occlusal forces can do a lot of damage to the periodontal ligament. So they did these things called human studies. Dr. Glickman, we've heard of Glickman before, introduced the concept of co-destruction. And that states that inflammation and trauma from occlusion are synergistic factors in periodontal destruction. They work together to cause periodontal destruction. So inflammation of the supporting tissues in the presence of excessive occlusal forces alters that pathway of inflammation. So you have to, with this theory of co-destruction, have inflammation and occlusal trauma together and the pathway of destruction, all right? So that inflammatory infiltrate spreads more rapidly through the tissues. The infiltrate goes directly into the periodontal ligament space, and that results in angular or vertical bone, bony defects. If the angular defects are seen on the radiograph and these sites can't be probed with the periodontal probe, it's more likely that the tooth is in occlusal trauma. It's not true bone resorption, okay? So you'll see somebody that looks like they're a, um, a mild periodontitis or a moderate periodontitis, and yet the tissues are at the CEJ. Their probing depths is two to three millimeters. You're not seeing that four to five millimeters that you're expecting to see. You're seeing vertical bony defects probably occlusal traumatism, all of those other words that we looked at. So you have to take a look again at those vertical bite wings and your periapicals to see how wide is that PDL space. So the inflammatory infiltrate spreads more rapidly through the tissues. So according to this theory of co-destruction by Glickman, the inflammation and occlusal trauma become co-destructive and the progression of periodontitis is then accelerated by the presence of occlusal trauma. So you need to have both factors and they work together. And when you have the two together, it works more rapidly. Some of the um, studies are showing that occlusal forces and inflammation are not co-destructive. The debate is still on, but so for now, we're saying that occlusal forces alone do not cause gingivitis or periodontal disease without inflammation. So they did animal studies and um, that is done to try to reproduce the kind of occlusal trauma that occurs in the human model. So jiggling forces were applied in opposite directions to teeth at the same time and uh, that prevents the tooth from moving away from the source. The tissue inflammation was reproduced with silk ligatures around the tooth with plaque retentive surfaces, again, for the uh, plaque accumulation, right? So they did animal studies and the animal studies were really with beagles. Uh, they're, uh, been, they talk about this in board review classes, these beagle studies. But most research using animal models did not find that occlusal trauma really accelerated the progression of periodontal disease. So they're not finding that this co-destructive property is really valid, but it's the only thing out there that we've got. So that's what we're learning about because studies haven't come up with anything else right now. So what are some of the pathogenesis of occlusal trauma? Different features of occlusal trauma um, okay, show up 
different ways versus just plain inflammation. Occlusal trauma does not involve the inflammatory or immune cells. So no signs of inflammation are generally present when you have occlusal trauma alone. You can have healthy tissues. The lesion of occlusal trauma develops following compression and tension of the PDL fibers. Okay, so you've got excessive occlusal force that's applied to the teeth. So you've got resorption and deposition of bone. Okay, resorption and deposition of bone. You've got compression and tension, compression and tension, compression and tension. And compression of the PDL fibers results in obstruction of the blood flow to the fibers, which result in bone destruction. Okay, it's the blood flow that's being hampered because of the compression of the PDL fibers. So if the rate of destruction is greater than the rate of repair, osteoblastic, osteoclastic, then injury may result. So alveolar bone always go, undergoes this osteoclastic activity where there's bone being resorbed and bone being replaced. Okay, but in areas of pressure, the results are the classic widening of the PDL space, okay? And that's what we look at when we're looking at our radiographs, especially our vertical bite wings. So clinically, it's evident as, um, occlusal trauma is evidence as tooth mobility, which occurs to accommodate that widened PDL space, right? Because the ligaments aren't uh, hammocking the tooth real tight. So there's going to be increasing tooth mobility until that PDL can adapt to the applied force. And when the tooth is adapted to that force, a new lamina dura will be seen radiographically. So only when the occlusal trauma is eliminated will the bone repair occur and the functional width of the PDL space is reestablished. The gingiva connective tissue is not affected. So there is no attachment loss or apical migration of the junctional epithelium from occlusal trauma alone. This is the theory right now. And those of you that are working for dentists, think about the number of night guards that have been made with um, telling the patients you have recession, you have occlusal trauma, you need a night guard, right? Science right now is not telling us that that's what is uh, causing it. So we've got two different kinds of occlusal trauma. We have primary occlusal trauma, and that's injury to the supporting structures, again, PDL, cementum, and bone, that's caused by excessive occlusal force. Again, those are forces greater than experienced during normal chewing. Um, it's placed on the tooth or teeth in a healthy periodontium. So you need a healthy periodontium for primary occlusal trauma. Examples of that are that, excuse me, the high restoration, orthodontic movement, denture class, parafunctional habits, malpositioned teeth, healthy periodontium, primary occlusal trauma. Okay, there could be some tooth mobility. You've got your widened PDL as that tooth is jiggling. Then you have secondary occlusal trauma. So remember a primary occlusal trauma has a healthy periodontium and you have excessive forces. Secondary occlusal trauma is normal or excessive forces, okay? Normal is nowhere, um, normal forces aren't involved in primary occlusal trauma, right? It, normal or excessive, force for the secondary occlusal trauma that cause injury to the periodontium with reduced bone support. So you have to have bone loss to have secondary occlusal trauma. And it could be normal chewing it, causing that trauma. Bone levels around the teeth are inadequate to support even normal forces of chewing. Right, so secondary occlusal trauma, there's not enough support to keep that tooth from wiggling, even in normal chewing. Primary occlusal trauma versus secondary occlusal trauma. And my friends, here it is. All right, 
everything you need to know. So increasing tooth mobility is the most common sign of occlusal trauma. Does that sound like a test question to you? Most emphasis is on increasing mobility, okay? That's why you check mobility each and every time you're doing a periodontal survey on your patient. Since mobility due to occlusal trauma is an adaptive function, it may not be considered pathologic, okay? It's an adaptive function, especially if there's normal periodontia. You're looking for fremitus. You're having the patient go bite, 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 and your finger is on their anterior teeth to see if those mandibular anterior teeth are hitting the maxillary anterior teeth. They shouldn't be when the patient is biting. So we have mobility for occlusal trauma. Sometimes there's pain, pain to percussion. When you're tapping on the tooth, tap, 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 that can hurt. Pain on biting or just general hypersensitivity. Tooth migration can be created from that secondary occlusal trauma, not enough bone support. Okay, the tooth has had severe bone loss around it or tooth migration because a tooth has been lost and is shifting mesial drift and it's angling down onto the side. All right, so you can see that this is occlusal trauma here, as well as periodontal on um, the mandibular. You've got a crossbite, okay, from the anterior uh, lateral incisor to the canine. You've got edge to edge on this left side here. You probably have fremitus going on here, and you've got breakdown, periodontal breakdown there. What are you looking for when you're looking at occlusal trauma? You're looking for attrition from bruxism or grinding, and those are flattened incisal surfaces or occlusal surfaces. You're looking for abfractions, and that's loss of tooth structure from excessive occlusal forces. When, remember these teeth are in a hammock of our periodontal ligaments. So there is microscopic movement when we use our teeth. Small cracks or notches in the cervical area of the tooth are created and then the, uh, that tooth surface just kind of flex off. So you can see bruxism here, okay, indicating heavy bite. The teeth are flat, you can see the dentin you can see the chips and when that patient bites edge to edge, these teeth are all going to fit perfectly edge to edge. You're gonna see them match up. Wear facets. Remember canines are pretty pointy teeth, okay? This point has been worn down and you can see a wear facet. You can see wear facets here. You're looking for areas of use. Other clinical sign, uh, findings, TMJ, pain, they're opening and closing. Does your jaw give you any discomfort? It's usually during chewing or upon wakening in the morning if they're a nocturnal bruxer, okay, grinding at night. You're looking for tooth fractures and chipping of the enamel. Um, we have a number of patients that are wearing night guards and they've cracked teeth that have needed to be um, replaced with implants and the implants fail because they're still grinding even though they're wearing a night guard. They're still, their bite is still too heavy. We're looking at radiographs for that widening PDL, okay? And due to an adaptation response um, to accommodate excessive occlusal forces, this PDL might look different from one full mouth series to another. You're looking for vertical bone loss. Okay, it may or may not be evident. So you don't wanna confuse the bone loss due to periodontitis. Remember, vertical bone loss on a radiograph isn't going to have the pocketing that vertical bone loss from infrabony pocketing occurring from the periodontal disease. So if there's a widened PDL space, but no tooth mobility, you want to look for occlusal 
trauma. Something we can't fix as hygienists, it's out of our scope, but we can bring it up to the dentist. Look how wide this PDL space is. Huge. Vertical bone loss. Okay, this tooth is, uh, this bridge is hanging on by a wing and a prayer. Bone loss. There's not a whole lot holding that abutment tooth in. So this is primary occlusal trauma on the premolar, secondary occlusal trauma here. Look at the crown to root ratio and how much is covered with bone. Where is it? Okay, the bone is here. This is advanced bone loss. Very little bone supporting the teeth. You can bet those teeth are going to wiggle. Hypercementosis also. Hypercementosis is thought to be the thickening of um, the cementum at the apical third of the tooth. Remember, that's where your cellular cementum is due to trauma. Occlusal trauma is trauma. It's not necessarily somebody being hit in the mouth, right? It could be occlusal trauma as well. Occlusal overload in implants. So remember that uh, dental implants don't have a periodontal ligament space. They respond differently to the natural teeth, to occlusal overload. They don't have PDLs, so there's no adaption to excessive forces, but occlusal overload can lead to implant fracture or loosening of the fixture or the crown of the implant itself. So you're always looking at these implants. You're seeing if they're loose. Is it the implant root form that's loose or is it the um, prosthetic, the crown, that's loose? So our desired income, uh, outcome, excuse me, for treatment of occlusal trauma is that the patient remains comfortable doing chewing, during chewing, and is able to maintain the dentition in a state of health. That's the outcome of occlusal trauma treatment. Bring them to a steady state of health. Now, according to the AAP, American Academy of Periodontology, outcomes of treatment, what are we expecting? We would hope to eliminate or significantly reduce the tooth mobility because we want the patient to be in comfort when in function. We want to eliminate occlusal prematurities and frematis. We want to eliminate parafunctional habits. We want to prevent further tooth migration and decrease or stabilize the radiographic changes. Okay, that is the ideal outcome. What is an inadequate resolution of occlusal trauma as identified by the AAP? Increasing tooth mobility progressive or more tooth migration, the patient continues to have discomfort or pain or tooth mobility, and the premature contacts are not resolved. Common sense. Radiographically, the signs of occlusal trauma are not resolving. You still have your widened PDL space. The parafunctional habits are continuing and TMJ problems remain or are worsening. So they still have pain. What's the treatment of occlusal trauma? Selective grinding, occlusal adjustment, selective grinding. Okay, the patient bites down on some um, articulating paper or blue paper, red, green, different, different colors for thicknesses. They bite, bite, bite. They grind, grind, grind. And then the doctor checks to see where those contact points are. Right? And um, you want to control the habits. That's something that we can do as dental hygienists. Orthodontic tooth movement can um, put things in better function. Splinting teeth, for example, the mandibular anterior, if the teeth are wobbly by making them more into a picket fence, they're stabilized instead of just moving one tooth independently from another. Uh, restorative procedures as well as monitoring without treatment. So the patient can go through occlusal therapy 
some of this is physiologic occlusion um, that doesn't need treatment. Sometimes you're just making the patient aware that they're grinding or that they have this parafunctional habit and that's all they need to stop. Uh, it's usually not the case. So again, selective grinding, the dentist will reshape the um, contacts between the maxillary and mandibular teeth to create a harmonious contact. And it's only done after the inflammation is controlled or eliminated. Because if there's a lot of tooth mobility, think about it, if they've got inflammation in addition to occlusal trauma, that inflammation might be exacerbating the mobility. So you don't know when you're going to be over treating because you can't put the enamel back once it's ground down. Right, and this is done by the dentist. And this is done in cases of primary occlusal trauma. Remember, they've got the normal periodontium. You want to control the parafunctional habits. Myofunctional exercises, orthodontics to put teeth in a more harmonious position, restorative procedures, using a night guard. It keeps the teeth separated, so it doesn't keep the patient necessarily from grinding. They're still going to grind, but they're grinding this hard acrylic instead of their teeth. And it's keeping the mouth open in a more neutral position for the TMJ. Splinting is with mobility and it can be used to prevent secondary occlusal trauma. For example, after periodontal surgery, think about those mandibular anterior teeth that we've seen. This is splinting by way of crown and bridge. These are all crowns. They are all individual teeth. They're not missing any teeth, but these are fused together. So the patient's not gonna be able to floss in between here. They've gotta be able to use a, either a Proxa brush or get a floss threader to use in between here so they can clean this area and that area. This is extra coronal splinting. You'll see this a lot. Think about where that bone is, mucogingival defects here, not a lot of bone support. So by fusing these teeth together, it's adding support. This is a pain in the neck to clean as a dental hygienist. It's a pain for the patient to clean too. You're gonna to have calculus here and calculus all around this composite. Here is very difficult to adequately clean without feeling like you're going to be chipping off composites. And look at the attrition here and here. Those teeth are just flat. So occlusal trauma, does not initiate gingivitis or periodontitis. Parafunctional habits may cause occlusal trauma. <clears throat> the most common sign of occlusal trauma is increasing tooth mobility. The most common sign of clinical sign anyway of occlusal trauma is increasing tooth mobility. You have pathologic tooth migration. That's usually indicative in moderate or severe periodontitis. Remember that secondary occlusal trauma, so they don't have the bone support. Dental implants are going to respond differently to um, the occlusal overload because they don't have the PDL, so you're gonna see more failures in implants because of a heavy occlusal load. And different treatments are available depending on what's going on with the patient. So let's take a look at a couple questions here. Which type of occlusal trauma occurs when normal or excessive forces cause injury to the periodontium with reduced bone support? Normal or excessive reduced bone support. We talked about primary occlusal trauma, secondary occlusal trauma. We never talked about tertiary. So cross that out. And you know it's either primary or secondary. So you know it's not none of the above right? And it's secondary because it's normal or excessive and reduced periodontia. Maximal intercuspation or contact of the maxillary and mandibular teeth is referred to 
centric relation, centric occlusion, malocclusion, or occlusal trauma. So let's take out C and D, and you're going, oh no, is it centric relation or centric occlusion? Centric occlusion is when you're biting down really hard. Okay, that's, and centric relation, I always looked at relation is the most retruded portion. That's when the mandible is being jiggled and trying to be moved back, retruded relation. So centric occlusion by process of elimination. Easy for me to say, huh? The most common sign of occlusal trauma is what? Increasing mobility. A dental implant is less able to adapt to excessive forces due to the lack of periodontal ligament. There's no cushioning, no hammocking. Okay, guys, that is occlusal trauma or occlusal. What did I, that what did, what was the chapter's title? Uh, occlusal trauma. All right. That's it for now. Bye.